yeah, it's not always easy to give presentation. Eh? <laughs> yeah, I was asked to come and talk about alien and invasive species uh, compliance part, and um, I thought it was very easy task to deliver. Um, but I thought, she, on the other side, I thought, you know what, um, it could be boring because it's going to be one slide and people will be surprised how prepared I am. Because generally, um, my colleague here have covered um, everything. So for me, if I am to sum it up, is to say that uh, compliance is mainly uh, to look at all the restrictive activities that she talked about, whether are those who are conducting those restrictive activities are conducting them in line to uh, the regulations or not. And if they are not, basically they are non compliant. And that's basically simple. It. If you've got a if you are expected to have a permit to conduct restricted activity involving category two listed invasive species, and you don't have a permit. Uh, that is a non-compliant. So basically that's what we, 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 we do. But I thought uh, maybe um, because uh, the talk um, didn't really talk, uh, introduce much about the invasive species, I thought I should start um, by giving, um, defining what um, aliens are. And uh, I think we all know that aliens are stuff or species that are not indigenous. Any non indigenous species is regarded as alien. But now, the regulations that we are busy discussing about here, the alien and invasive species regulations, talk of alien and invasive. So, um, alien is anything that is not indigenous. Um, the fortunate part or the unfortunate part is that um, in within the alien species, we have got those alien species that are beneficial, they are not invasive. Um, those that we use for economical purposes, for social purposes, some of them, uh, I think my colleague touched on, um, we classify, we regard them as not invasive. Uh, some of them we use them as food. Our maize, for sure, uh, that maize meal that we eat um, are not necessarily indigenous to um, this area. So they were brought in as aliens, but they are not invasive. So for the purpose of the regulations, um, the alien and invasive species were separated. We have got alien species and we've got uh, the invasive ones. And the invasive ones are those ones that are listed in terms of notice one of the invasive um, species not um, list. Um, and the listed part of the species is not just um, something that was uh, thought of in one day. The species were listed, uh, I should be listed uh, basically through the process of risk analysis, meaning that um, the species need to be uh, thoroughly evaluated to determine their invasive status, whether they could be the post potential risk of becoming invasive or not. And um, of course she talks about the, the category. Um, after being assessed, then they go to be categorized according to uh, those categories that she referred to, which is category 1A, 1B, 2 and uh, 3. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so the question that um, mostly uh, people ask, why do we necessarily need to list those uh, invasive species? And we look at the, much as I talked about aliens, uh, the ones that are listed are the invasive ones. And why do we need to, what do we need to consider? Or why do we need to list them? Uh, it's basically due to their negative impact that they pose to the environment. Um, most of them, they are highly um, competitive. Um, when they, are, they got established to the new area, they tend to um, grow very fast. Uh, they tend to have high reproductive rate. Um, and 
they pose some uh, health risk. Um, we know of uh, some species like you are uh, lantana that are poisonous to, um, to, 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 to animals. Farmine wheat, people react badly. There are seasons in the year where people will suffer respiratory, like having the sinus uh, due to the pollens that comes from those uh, plants uh, species, mainly because the, those species are not indigenous and um, um, people are now being introduced into those species. I mean, um, Personally, uh, coming from Limpopo, when I, I, I got to Pretoria first time in 2000, I uh, had serious problem uh, during uh, September time when the Chakaranda uh, uh, tree is busy flowering there. So, um, they, 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 those um, uh, species pose serious environmental risk. Uh, some of them, they also uh, produce the so-called uh, allelopathic chemicals. Uh, that would mean that whenever they grow, uh, they ex exude some chemicals, deterrents, that um, make indigenous species not to, to grow. And um, you will find that uh, some of them, for example, when we talk of um, environmental risk, uh, the species like your Azola that uh, is aquatic, um, when it covers the, the water body, um, it's a reddish in color in such a way that even if animal is running, um, it doesn't see that uh, this water um, can find itself in uh, because it's right, it's, it's purely covered uh, the, the, the water body. Just like you've seen with the water ice in the picture that um, uh, Kay just showed how the water ice covers the water body, uh, where you almost see like it's a uh, a soccer field or, uh, you know, so they, they, those are the risks that uh, come with uh, the, 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 the invasive um, species. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, and, um, I mean, the other risks that are um, being assessed or looked at is the, in terms of the interbreeding. Some of those species um, upon introduction, we find that they will interbreed with um, our indigenous species or other species. And in the, through that interbreeding, uh, that's where we find that we, um, the offsprings that comes out might be even worse um, aggressive and difficult to, 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 to control. Um, generally, um, they affect the, 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 the function of uh, the ecosystem, and um, I'm saying that is because they, 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 they create some sorts of imbalance. Um, looking at the aquatic ridges, I give example on um, at the Azola species um, and the, um, the water hyacinth. Um, the way they grow and cover the water um, surface, uh, you can imagine there are other organisms living underwater. They, that will suffer from uh, not receiving enough sunlight, much less uh, oxygen. And um, yeah, that creates uh, uh, some imbalance within that um, uh, uh, ecosystem. And we know that most of them um, tend to uh, use a lot of water, they consume a lot of water. Um, we've got quite a number of uh, wetlands that um, are no longer wetlands because um, invasive species grew that are in those areas and, and, and utilize all the water there. So um, that are basically the, the, the uh, negative impacts that um, invasive species pose. And that are not just limited to those, uh, those are just an example of what we are dealing with um, uh, we can go on and on with uh, what the, 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 the impact are. We know that the impact are socially, economic, and uh, also um, environmental. <coughs> the, how, do, how do those species basically spread? Is that um, the main culprit of uh, the, um, the invasive species spread is international trade. 
And uh, I mean, talking of international trade, I mean, today we are living in a global um, world where um, if I want to be in America in the next 24 hours, uh, I will be there and visiting my friend or my colleague there. It's easy for me to uh, bring in some small seeds in my pocket of whatever plant. By the way, even scientists sometimes, as they go out to the field, um, those scientists, as scientists going out to um, other countries conducting research, for example, for biological control, um, take an example of um, what we call blackjack. Uh, you go to the field and then you start on your, tr on your trouser there, uh, you don't see it, you pack, you, you, you come back, you, 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 you exchange, you bring, basically after you come back, you brought that two, three seeds of those. You wash it here, um, it starts growing somewhere. That's basically how those um, species spread, but that is unintentional. But the main culprit is the international trade, and that is um, facilitated by um, market demand. It could be through our fundamental pets, uh, traders, um, it's, it's basically depend on what people want on, 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 on the market. So, um, of course, there are unintentional um, introduction. Um, things like, for example, your house crew that she, she, she talked about, it could be that the, way, um, the birds migrated from uh, wherever, that is natural means. They just, they, they just migrated from one area to another. But they, on the other hand, it could be that uh, the birds were uh, found itself on the ship somewhere sitting there, and the ship traveled all the way up until it reaches here. Um, so it's, it's not something that we have got uh, really control on, much as there are measures that are put in place uh, to try and mitigate the risk associated to transportation um, or a transport that moves goods from one um, uh, parts of the country to, 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 to or parts of the world to another. Um, naturally, um, we always have disasters um, that sometimes, um, in case I tell, we had during this disaster that they were crocodiles they were, that were washed out from uh, one facility to, to, to another. So basically, in natural uh, disasters, sometimes natural means uh, species will be moved from uh, one area to another. But, but for the purpose of the regulation, uh, as she uh, mentioned, is to mainly regulate the intended uh, um, introduction. Because um, uh, basically, uh, the natural means one we have got no control over. That is basically now uh, the, 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 the purpose of um, the Chapter 5 of the National Environmental Management Biodiversity Act, which she has basically um, alluded to, and I'm not going to um, talk on those ones. Um, but what is important uh, on this chapter is that the Section 73 of the National Environmental Management Biodiversity Act gave a duty of care to any landowners that uh, they actually have to report uh, if there's any alien species occurring on your property, you need to report it. Uh, not just only to report, but you also need to control. Um, um, take necessary steps to ensure that you prevent harm to, um, to biodiversity. Um, and um, sometimes uh, we're talking about uh, authorizations that you, you, you basically need to have a permit to conduct any restricted activity that will involve your category 2 listed invasive uh, species and also need to comply with the uh, exemption part. So um, if uh, you are exempted either by a permit or through exemptions that are, exist in terms of the regulate and under the regulations, you need to make sure that you comply with those um, exemptions. 
I'll give you an example. If you are in possession, if you were in possession of Indian miner um, uh, before the regulations came into effect, it's category three, you're exempted to keep it. However, as she indicated, uh, you are prohibited to conduct any further activity. You cannot breed on that, you cannot. So that's what we mean when we said you need to comply with those exemptions. Um, So, um, much as we're talking about the, um, and consider this is um, all this duty of care that I'm talking about, uh, the main compliance uh, areas, areas of com com compliance, because should you not re should you not report it, or you're not controlling, or not taking any necessary steps to control, or you do not have a permit, or you, not, you don't comply with your permit conditions, as well as uh, not complying with the exemptions. It basically, it's a non-compliance. Um, and I'll talk about uh, what comes next. Um, so, the, the Act also gives provision that uh, much as um, the landowners need to um, control the listed invasive species, they actually need to use relevant, appropriate methods. And the, meaning that the methods that need to be used uh, should be, will say that they should be environmentally friendly. You should um, or comply with the prescriptions of those treatment uh, chemicals, if you are using chemical. I mean, if it says 10 liter per 100 liter, and you go and put 15 liters per 100 liters, then now, um, it's not about the overdose only, but it's all about. It's also about the um, the, the, the chemical that you're putting into in the environment. Um, how much and how long does it take for that? Will now take for the chemical to degrade um, in that environment? And what are the negative impact that um, high dosage of uh, those uh, chemicals are going to have? Remember now, this might have uh, unintended consequences where now uh, you end up also killing unintended or non-targeted uh, species because of the uh, chemical overdose uh, in this instance. Uh, looking at the environment, at the area where you're controlling the species from, um, if it's a tree, you might have to cut the stem and apply herbicides rather than using these calculators and dig and leave all those uh, um, or disturb the, the, the soil surface there. Um, but uh, talking of the effectivity of the uh, control measure methods also mean that uh, you shouldn't only target a certain stage of um, the species but try and deal with the species in various uh, uh, um, stage from if it's a plant, you start from seedlings up until the mature tree. So you need to have a sustainable, sustainable method that you know you will apply for the seedlings and um, for the middle growth plant as well as you get to um, the mature um, plant. Um, failure to do this. Um, Failure to comply with those duties of care and failure not to do, to control according to the law, then that constitutes a non compliance. And now, what follows from the non compliance um, is that um, my colleague, Britta, is going to tell you what um, transpired. But what, 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 what we do from the compliance side is that we will do the compliance inspection or if it's a, a request for us to um, uh, uh, do inspection or issue a, a directive, we will do compliance inspection, verify the non-compliance, and um, soon as we determine, determine the non-compliance, we compile our own report, send it for enforcement, and I think uh, my colleague Peter will be in the right position to tell you the processes and the fines or the the cases, how um, the case will go, because uh, it might be 
that she should end up in the court of law. So that she will um, she will talk about. Um, those are the the the, 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 the issues that I was talking about. So, um, and I think there's only one slide that I missed out of my presentation. I forgot about it yesterday. I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, indication of, in terms of compliance in first aid, what, um, what has transpired. But uh, generally, nationally, I've got the information that we managed to um, conduct about uh, a thousand um, um, uh, compliance inspection nationally. Uh, with the little capacity that we have. Um, and out of that, there were significant number of uh, non-compliance um, that we have uh, elevated for um, enforcement. And I think uh, Rita will then uh, take over and tell us more about the enforcement work and how it was. Um, I thank you. <laughs>